Google Hangout. I think this is live right now. So hey, everyone, welcome to this Google Hangout. I'm going to be recording this. So this is an AMA, my first ever Ask Me Anything. And I'm doing it with Skillshare.com, which is one of the, class, the websites that I teach on. And so I thought it would be a cool idea to basically have this live feed going while I answer questions. So if you want to ask me any questions, you can check out the website below, the Skillshare.com link. Um, and here, let me just update it. So Skillshare.com forward slash A-M-A-S slash five. And that will take you to the page where I am answering questions during the this Ask Me Anything. And you can ask me questions on anything video related. So video editing, production, motion graphics, creating a business with video, YouTube channel, you name, whatever it is, you can check it out there. I'm gonna go ahead and just share this link with um, the people on Skillshare. So I'm gonna be kind of going back and forth, talking to the camera, and then of course answering the questions. And so let me just edit this so that people on the Skillshare page no, so I'm just going to say, uh, join me live through this Google Hangout. While I answer questions. I don't know if anyone's going to even watch this live, but I thought it'd be kind of cool to, to do so. So, OK, so we're live right now. Already getting a lot of questions. Uh, I'm going to go from the oldest ones uh, to the newest ones. And so Ethan Kiesler uh, asks about what is your preferred motion graphics creation app? And some of the, these I've actually already um, answer, or written out the answer to. But actually, before I um, do that, I just want to give a little bit more information about myself. Uh, so those of you who are watching this uh, live or a recording, know a little bit more about who I am and why am I doing this AMA. So my name is Phil Ebner, as you can see. I am a video creator. I went to film school and I've been doing a lot of professional video editing and motion graphics over the past few years since I graduated. And then recently I've started to teach my skills online with classes on places like Skillshare. And so, and through my own website, videoschoolonline.com. And so I've been teaching a lot of classes, teaching video editing, teaching uh, motion graphics, photography, a bunch of different skills. And I'm building that business while I'm also doing a lot of video work. And so that's a little bit about me. Let's get straight into these questions though. So back to Ethan's question about why, what is my preferred motion graphics creation app? So I really love After Effects. He asks After Effects or motion and uh, I'm just going to post this my answer there about After Effects. And I just love it because I work with my Adobe pro products like Adobe Premiere Pro. And so uh, the two programs, After Effects and Premiere Pro, work really well together. And since I do edit with Premiere Pro, it just makes sense for me to do motion graphics with uh, After Effects. I can do live editing, so I can basically have both programs open I could edit my video sequence in Premiere Pro, and then I can add titles and graphics through, through After Effects. I can place them into the Premiere Pro sequence, and then if I need to make any changes, I can just go to After Effects, make those changes, and they actually automatically appear in Premiere Pro. And I don't have to do any exporting or any importing and doing all sorts of versions of graphics. It's all just live. And so that's why I like After Effects. Ethan also asks about motion graphics. What do you find to be the most important thought to keep in mind when making videos entirely built of motion graphics? This is a very good question because creating, I've done a lot of these where I create a video entirely based on motion graphics. And it can be very difficult editing a video completely in After Effects or motion because the timeline is set up different than, say, in Premiere Pro, which is really based on editing a sequence. I always tell people that, and this is very technical for so some of you might not really understand this, but Premiere Pro is for editing a sequence this way. So you're going in time, 
you're putting together clips in order. Whereas After Effects and Motion are for editing sequences this way. You're layering a bunch of layers on top of each other, and it's not as much about putting together a sequence of clips or building an entire video in motion graphics. That being said, when I do create my entire videos in motion graphics, some of the things that I keep in mind are planning it out beforehand. I have a storyboard. Uh, I try to storyboard everything or have a very solid outline before I start creating the graphics. So that way, when I do go into After Effects or the tool that you're using, you know how many compositions you will have and you kind of have a sense for how you will build your graphics. You have your different scenes basically and each scene is its own composition. And then, and you don't want to try to start from the beginning on one composition and create your whole video on that one composition because then in After Effects, your composition is going to have hundreds of layers. It's gonna to be too hard to work with. You want to create individual compositions for each scene, and then how do those scenes work together? How do you transition from one scene to the next? That's the next big thing. So thinking about creatively, how is it going to transition? Maybe it's through some sort of transition like a dissolve or motion, but then technically, how are you gonna do that within After Effects? So those are the things that you should keep in mind. All right, let's move on to the next question. This is awesome that there are people actually uh, checking it out. So I see people posting questions. Nick Henry, one of my uh, favorite students as of late, he's been doing a lot of After Effects work through my classes. And just to mention, if you are on the Skillshare page below, you can see the classes that I teach over on the right-hand side. And so I encourage you, if you are on Skillshare, to sign up for some of those classes. Uh, and I, my most popular one right now is a photography master class that I taught with my friend Sam. But since this is all about video, I would highly encourage you to enroll in the After Effects course. I have a DSLR video course. And so if that's not showing up on the Skillshare page, Ask Me Anything page, click on the little Phil Ebner logo right there, uh, or the little profile bug, and you can see all of my other courses. So I see that there's a few people who are watching this right now. This is awesome. Uh, this is, I was trying to set this up on YouTube, like live streaming and I couldn't do it. So I had to switch over to Google Hangouts. And so I hope it's working. I couldn't figure out how to do the questions through this video, the chat. So if you are watching this, please just ask your questions through the Skillshare page. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Javi Warclimb. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing all these names right. He asks, why did I start making videos? Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the videos that I've been making, and I'm just gonna paste over my answer right there. So I started making videos a long time ago. I was probably 11, 10 or 11 when I started to pick up my parents' old Hi8 camera. I would use my Star Wars action figures to create scenes, and I didn't really think about that as I progressed in my video career, I never thought back to those days because it was just so fun and it was just playing to me. But I think because of that, I did get more into working with the camera. And so back in the late 90s, I would say, maybe early 2000s, when I was around 13 years old, I got my first digital camera. It was when they were brand new and the size and the quality of the digital cameras were really bad but my camera could shoot little 30 second video clips. That's, that's it, you could shoot up to 30 seconds. And so I would take that camera around and start shooting all sorts of things and putting together little montages, editing them in Windows Movie Maker. From there, in, as I got into high school, I got more into videos and I actually started a TV show. It was like a local cable television show with my friend where we just talked about baseball. It was like a sports talk show basically. And that put me in front of the camera a lot. Uh, and um, that through that process of learning how to be on camera and how to put together a TV show, I learned a lot about behind the scenes work of the camera, the editing, the directing of a TV show. And that's really how I fell in love with video making 
And I went to film school because of that. And I started making a lot of documentaries in film school. I mean, really the reason why I started making videos was to tell a story, to share stories. And I've always been a fan of telling stories through uh, visual, visual photos and, uh, and video. Um, and it's just something that I've been good at. So I've had a lot of fun doing it over the years. And now I do a lot of teaching through video. I would love to get back into more documentary work though. So Javi also asked about how do you develop your own style for wedding videos? So I wrote down, so again, I have a couple more questions that I already saw before this started that I answered, I wrote down the answers to. This is really important because I think as a wedding videographer, videographer or any type of videographer, you have to come up with your own style so that you separate yourself from the crowd. There are so many people out there now that are trying to make money, do a business as a videographer. Anybody can really pick up a camera, purchase a DSLR video camera or a camera and start shooting video and call themselves a wedding videographer. So how do you stand out? And I think it, what I wrote down was that style comes from a lot of things. Uh, but I think it really comes down to your shooting style, your cinematography, and then your editing. And so for me personally, I might not be the best cinematographer. I know that, um, compared to a lot of the people out there that do wedding videography, um, I, I'm definitely not the best. People have better equipment. They have drones, they have sliders, they have steady cams. Usually when I go out doing what, my own weddings, I have a monopod with a DSLR camera. And lately I've been shooting with more professional cinema cameras like the Canon C100, C300 series, and then Sony FS7s. Those are some really higher end documentary style cameras that are good for weddings. But in terms of my style for my wedding videos, uh, in I have a lot of style through my editing, I think. I see a lot of videos that basically, because people just do highlight videos now, that's like the popular thing just to do a highlight video. I see a lot of people who just put together the best shots in a sequence and put a, the latest pop song on it and they call it a wedding video. And that's great because you get to see beautiful shots. It's so pretty with the cameras nowadays and the editing capabilities of doing some color correction uh, to make it really lovely. But I try to tell a story through my editing. So I'm using the speeches, so the sound bites from the speeches and sound bites throughout the day even just sound bites from getting ready. You have the bride, the groom, the groomsmen, the bridesmaids. They're laughing as they're getting ready. And I try to pull sound bites from those different moments to add to my edit to really create a story. My style is very, uh, in terms of editing, it's not linear, it's not chronological. So I'm not necessarily starting with them getting ready, going to the ceremony, then going to uh, the the rehearsal, uh, the reception. I like to kind of mish mishmash all those together and edit different types of shots together that look good. Um, and so it's kind of a mix. In terms of my cinematography style, I'm very fly on the wall. I know a lot of photographers and videographers who like to set up shots. They like to like literally have the bride and groom or the bride and bride or groom and groom rehearse and like walk a certain way and they'll tell them, okay, do that again, do that again. And I really just try to be a fly on the wall and catch the natural movements, the natural mo moments. There are times when I'm like, oh, I have this shot in mind. Can you, walk down this path and I'll get a shot of you walking away or walking towards the camera. Um, but I really try to stay, be a fly on the wall and not, um, not, not necessarily not interact with them. I do interact with them throughout the entire day. That's one of the great things about wedding videography and photography. You get to interact with the, the couple throughout the day. Like you're literally closer to them throughout the day than anybody else even their parents, their, their bridesmaids and grooms, and you're with them. So that's really special. 
but I kind of just let them do their, their own thing. And I just capture that real stuff with my cinematography. I'm trying to get a lot of negative space. So whether that's shooting the couple or whoever, like in the very bottom corner of your shot with lots of open sky or putting something in between you and your subject. So if I see the subject getting ready, maybe standing behind a door frame and revealing them from the door frame or putting a vase or something in front of the camera. So all you see is the person kind of in the corner of your frame. So doing a lot of creative negative space stuff. And so developing your own style, it's important. It comes across not only in your videos, but also in your website. And, and there's a bunch of different styles. I, I have worked with companies that have a very polished um, glamour style, I would say, I would call it. It looks like something from a magazine. You would go to their website and you would think maybe it's a website to get tickets to a club or to go to Vegas or something. And then I've seen a lot of websites that it feels like you're at a backyard picnic and they have a lot of more relaxed photos on their website and you can just tell from their videography it's it's more relaxed. And so a style, that that's a difficult question, but I hope that kind of a answers your question. All right, so the last question I had, let me just refresh this page to see if there's a lot of questions, a lot more questions being asked. Okay, so we do got a lot of questions coming in. Okay, so the next question is Kara Mattison from Skillshare. So thanks for asking this question. Three tips for creating a video. It's always hard to condense something to, to tips, but I think I have three good ones. The first is to get a good microphone. I know this is kind of, um, for our, those of you who do make videos, you've probably heard this a hundred times, but for those of you who are new to video making, uh, it might not make too much sense, but I think getting a good microphone is so important for your video. You could shoot a great video with an iPhone or with a DSLR or with even an old high eight camera. It doesn't really matter what camera is. People get so caught up on, What's the resolution? What's the latest lens? What's the latest camera that I can use? But really you can get beautiful shots with any type of camera. Sure, better cameras, more expensive cameras and lenses will look better, but in general, you can get great footage with whatever camera you use. And so that makes audio that much more important. If you've watched a YouTube video you that has bad audio, you know how easy it is to exit out of that video and go to another one. So get a good microphone. If you're recording videos like what I'm doing right now, which is kind of like a screencast or tutorial, if you're a vlogger doing something like that, get a USB microphone like the Blue Yeti. Let me just hold this up right now so you might hear a lot of noise. The Blue Yeti or the Blue Snowball. This is the Blue Snowball. It's $50 on Amazon, super cheap but super high quality, and it sounds a lot better than the internal microphone of your computer. And I, for talking head videos, when I'm shooting documentaries or shooting my weddings or other projects, I use a wireless lavalier set by Sennheiser. And I'm just gonna post this so you can know. If you go on the page, uh, you can see what, I, what equipment I'm actually using. So the wireless Sennheiser set, it's expensive. It's a little pricey. It's like $600. And I connect that to a Zoom H4n audio recorder, um, but it's a very good set of microphones and I've tried cheaper options in terms of wireless lavaliers like the Asden kit, Asden, A-Z-D-E-N. It's like $200, but the quality is just so much better with the Sennheiser. So if you're using, getting a microphone, use, purchase something that is a brand that is well known, so like Rode, R-O-D-E, or Sennheiser, or for uh, USB microphones, something like the, U the Blue, which is B-L-U-E, Blue Snowball, or Blue Yeti. Let me just take a sip of water. I hope all you guys are enjoying this. I see there are seven viewers, awesome. So before I continue with the 
top three tips for better video, as I mentioned before, and ask me any questions on the link below, skillshare.com slash AMAS slash five. And you can find out more information about me at videoschoolonline.com and what I do. Or you can also visit philebener.com for my personal portfolio. And then um, if you are on Skillshare, check out some of my courses on the AMS, AMA, AMA page. You see some of my courses on the right side of the questions or click on my photo and go to my profile page to see all of the, uh, see all the classes that I teach. Okay, so tip number two for creating video for beginners. I think for me, I love editing, so I had to add something about editing. And my tip is to learn to edit with modern techniques, especially in terms of graphics and titles. Bad graphics, if you're using a bad font or bad colors or just not designing the shapes of your logos uh, and your titles, lower thirds or anything, if you do bad at that, it can make a good video look terrible and look like something from the past or just look like something that an amateur did. And so spend a little bit of time learning about fonts, about colors, about putting together a color palette. A website that I like to use a lot is Design Seeds. I think it's designseeds.com. I think it's design dash seeds, yeah, design dash seeds.com to just find cool color palettes. And when you're creating graphics, use a color palette so that you, that has colors that work well together. Um, and then use sans serif fonts. Sans serif fonts are the ones without the little glyphs. I don't know what you call them at the edge of the letters, something like an open sans font. One of my favorite fonts is league Gothic. So you can search for League Gothic on Google and there's a free download on the site. Um, let me just find what that is, League Gothic. The League of Movable Type.com. So let me just post this in the on the Skillshare page. If I can find it again. A great font, League Gothic. It's condensed, it's bold, I really like it. There's also another one, uh, League Spartan. And so do a little research, watch other videos, see what other people are doing in terms of graphics and titles, and try to copy them. That's basically what I've done my entire life, just copy other people that do good work. And uh, then through that, once you get good enough, you'll create your own style, you'll use things that you've seen in multiple places to come up with your own style. And then the third tip is just to practice, 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 and don't be a perfectionist. I went to film school and there were a lot of people in my class and there were only a handful of us that were posting videos on our websites, creating YouTube channels, putting stuff on Vimeo all the time. And there were a lot of people that just were too perfectionistic to ever finish a project or they were just scared to post it online and share it with the world. And I think it's so important to share our work with the world, even if it's not perfect. And um, that's just how I've gotten this far in life and with everything I do. And so it's working for me just to put out stuff, put out more content. I'm always putting out content on my website, on my YouTube channel. I you know, bring my camera with me on vacations or trips and I put together little montages. And I think it's just great practice to do that. And as I've spent more time over the past year or so creating online classes, this whole side business of mine of creating, teaching online classes and doing that kind of thing has kind of taken over a lot of the time that I used to spend actually creating videos. So I'm teaching a lot now, but I'm not creating as much. But I still try to set apart time to practice and to work on projects that push me, my limits, that make me learn new techniques. And so I've, I encourage all of you to never back away from a project that you don't think you can do. I'm a big fan of not necessarily faking it until you make it, but 
in a sense, faking it till you make it and just going for it. And if you have to learn on the job, learn on the job. And so post your videos, stop worrying about all of the technical details of, oh, what camera should you buy? What lens should you buy? What editing software? Just do it, just make it with whatever you have available to you. Okay, so I'm getting to the questions where I haven't written out answers to. So these questions might take a little bit longer for me to type out answers. And so if you're bored, uh, I see seven viewers still. If you're bored, you can watch this another time. But uh, I see John Funderburk. He's asking, I'm currently taking your Adobe After Effects class to upload daily videos on YouTube. Oh, okay. There's no period there. I'm currently taking your Adobe After Effects class. To upload video, daily videos on YouTube, I started with ScreenFlow, but realized for better production value, I needed After Effects. Where do you still use ScreenFlow? Okay, this is really big. Um, re this is something that I go through all the time. So I'd say that ScreenFlow, I use ScreenFlow to quickly edit my um, talking head screen capture videos. tutorials and, and other videos that don't need graphics. If, if I am you if I am um, if I am editing something, creating a video that needs graphics, I edit it in Premiere Pro. So ScreenFlow is super useful tool to quickly uh, batch record your videos. If uh, for those of you who don't know what ScreenFlow is, uh, it allows you to capture your screen. It allows you to capture video from a webcam and then audio either through your computer's microphone or a USB microphone. So it's super high quality, uh, and it allow and it's automatically synced up. So you don't have to record your video on one thing, your audio on another thing, and then your screencast of your computer, and then bring it all together in the editing room. It's all synced up automatically. And so that is when I would use um, ScreenFlow, just when I am making videos that don't need a lot of graphics in terms of After Effects. OK, so Nick asks, in the beginning when you were struggling with passive income, where did your motivation come from? And when was your first breakthrough? That first, this is really possible. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So in terms of passive income with video, um, there's a few ways to make passive income with video. I think there is, you can shoot stock footage. You can try to sell stock footage. You can put out videos on YouTube or somewhere where you can make ad money from it or you can try to sell your video. I know you, Vimeo has a program where you can actually sell your videos through the site, um, kind of like if you were on Amazon or iTunes and you were buying videos, you can actually sell your videos. Um, or what I've been doing is teaching online classes. That's where a lot of my passive income came from, and that's where my first passive income came from. So. Let me just write back to Nick. So my first passive income came from my first video editing class. Um, and in that first month, I made 60 bucks. Before that, I tried a lot of different things to try to make money online and come up with uh, businesses on the side, but it, nothing ever worked until I started teaching online courses. And I started on udemy.com. I've moved to another a number of platforms. Skillshare is one of my most popular platforms right now. And um, when I made that first $60, it was really incredible. So this was really a moment. I thought this is possible. I don't think if I if I didn't make money that first month, I don't think I would have um, really felt, or maybe that second 
in those first few months, I wouldn't have felt like, oh, I could do this. Let me put more effort into this. Um, and so let me just add a little bit to this for those of you who aren't watching the live stream. And then I'll talk to you guys about what I'm writing. What I'm saying is basically that one thing that I do with my passive income is to try to treat it as extra money so that you're not depending on it to pay for rent or to pay for food for that month. I think it's really hard to start out and create a business, try to create a passive income business where you're depending on that income for, for paying the bills. And so when I started, because everything I was making was basically extra money that I had in my bank uh, at the end of the month, I was able to put more effort into it and not really care if it fluctuated. And so let me continue writing a little bit more. So basically what I'm saying is that my best advice for creating passive income is just to put out as much content as possible, whatever you're doing to make passive income, whether you're teaching online classes, you're putting videos on YouTube, you're making motion graphics templates, whatever it is, just keep putting out content. I really think that around the year mark for me, that's when things really took off and I started to transition my lifestyle from working full time to working on my passive income business and my side business and growing that to the point now where I'm able to do that full time. And there's a lot of people that start out and give up after a few months because they think it's not working or it's not working fast enough for them. But I would say 99% of people who do create online businesses, it doesn't work out in the first month and it doesn't even work out in the first year. And it's probably 99% of the people that do have it work out, it takes about a year or two and they keep working at it throughout that entire first year. And so that is my answer for passive income. That's a really tough topic and something I could talk about for an entire Ask Me Anything. So we'll have to do another one about that, Nick. Okay, I have another question from PJ Budari. He asks, or she actually it looks like a girl. Hi, PJ. Uh, what software do you recommend for basic motion graphics animation, specifically 2D animation, illustration, cartoon style? And if and if different from the previous software, what do you recommend for motion graphics in general? So I would say After Effects for both. That's what I use. Um, you can really do amazing stuff with After Effects. It's a little bit harder to do um, intricate animations in terms of character animations, but it's not impossible. There's actually some, some really great classes on Skillshare on basic character animation, not that I've taught, but that other people have taught, and I highly recommend them to do. I mean, you could do everything in After Effects, really. You can do character animation. You can have characters talking. Um, and so that's, that's what I would use. Um, let me just write out the rest of this answer. 
and just for motion graphics, it's def and definitely would suggest it for motion graphics. And I've done, I've used it for hundreds of projects, both animation and motion graphics. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Markello asked, do you find it to be useful to know Cinema 4D in order to be a successful motion graphics artist or becoming very efficient in After Effects is good enough? I see lots of videos where there's 3D content, but wasn't sure if it's a collaboration of two different artists. Okay, this is a big question. Something that I am not actually, I actually don't use Cinema 4D, so, um, but is it is something that I want to use. I think there's a progression. I became a video editor and I learned how to edit videos really well. I learned After Effects and so I'm making motion graphics and I'm getting better every day and with every project that I do. My next step is to start adding 3D content to my motion graphics and to my videos. And so I probably will take that step to Cinema 4D. And so that's that's basically my answer to Markello. So let me just respond to this. But um, since I don't know Cinema 4D, I can't necessarily t say if a lot of videos that have 3D are two different artists, but I think it would be great to learn both because at, at least for everything that I do with video creation, I think it's important to know and understand how all the different areas work in terms of cinematography, pre-production, production, production. A lot of my projects are kind of one man band projects where I am shooting and editing uh, and promoting and everything. But a lot of, but there are projects that I work on where I just edit or I just do motion graphics. But it's good for me to be on set and see them shooting or to talk to the director before the project starts to, to understand what types of shots are they getting and maybe give them advice for what types of shots to get that will work good in the editing room. And so I think knowing all the different areas of video creation is important. So let me just respond to Markello. Saying I don't use Cinema 4D at all yet. I would love to learn. But basically what I said was what I told you earlier that I think it's important to know how to use both um, whether you're creating the entire project by yourself. If you can do 3D and 2D yourself, that's great because you can create amazing, amazing projects. But also, uh, if you are having someone do the 3D animation for you, it's just good to understand what they are doing. All right, so let's refresh this page and see if there's any more questions. Okay, looks like we got a few more, a couple more. Okay, Joseph Arnwein, Arnwein says, how exactly did you go about looking for an audience? How did you make your audience expand? And how do you know how much to charge a customer? Okay, this is really another good question. So I'm wondering if you're asking about the audience for a particular video or for 
my brand. Mm. I think that my answer is going to be that for a lot of my videos and for most videos in general, you have to really target a specific niche. And so, and those videos will do a lot better than if you create a video expecting the entire world to enjoy it. And so if you're creating a video about um, sports, baseball, let's say, you want to cut, you know, not only target baseball fans, but maybe like a specific team. That's not really good a good example, but I'm just thinking of like businesses and it's a really good idea to niche down your business and to find a really specific target customer. So maybe for, for video production, we're talking about um, food commercials. So this is something that my friend and I, we've been doing some, a lot of videos lately, uh, for Ghirardelli chocolate and we're getting really good at shooting food related commercials and videos. Our latest project was really cool. It was blue. We had like blueberries and chocolate and we were like slow motion throwing blueberries into chocolate and it was like really beautiful stuff. And so we're going to start promoting that video and taking it to other brands that do food, that, that are food brands to pitch ourselves as a video production company that can do videos for them. And I think that will, that's way better than us just going to non-food related brands with that video and saying, look at this great video that we made do you want to hire us to make your video about sports or whatever it is? And so really finding a specific customer is important. So let me kind of wrap my head around that and answer Joseph. So the first question was how exactly did you go about looking for the right audience? I might ask a question for him to clarify. For those of you who are, I see some people uh, logging off the live feed and coming back on, and, or some people dropping off and some new people watching this video feed. I'm actually currently answering a couple questions on the Skillshare page, and then I'm going to talk about it. So just give me one minute and I'll start talking about the answers that I'm writing. The last question from Joseph was, how do you know how much to charge a customer? This is a huge issue with videographers for anybody that's doing freelance video work. Um, just recently, as an example, I was, I so I actually incorporated my business video school online and uh, just for a number of reasons, but uh, just to make it more official. And before I had Phil Ebener Productions, but now I'm running everything through, through Video School Online. And when I was down at the local city hall registering my business, I met a woman who was also starting her own business. And she, I told her that I was a video creator 
and that um yeah we make all sorts of videos and she was like oh that's great like we would love to make some videos for our our company and she's asking how much do you charge and i hate that question because it's so hard to, to know how much to charge when you don't know what their budget is what their business is and even or what type of video they really want and i just told her it really depends i we make videos that are a minute long that costs five hundred dollars and we make minute long videos that cost ten thousand dollars uh, just recently this video that we made for Garadelli cost over fourteen thousand dollars and because it was a huge pro project we had a set with about seven or eight workers cinematographers lighting grip dp directors producers me as the editor and motion graphics artist um but then there's other videos where it's just me going out shooting a quick interview with someone that i'll charge a few hundred dollars for and she kind of responded like oh well wow we're definitely more on the lower end the 500 to 700 dollar range and so it's really hard i think the best advice is to get as much information as you can before you say how much you charge so what kind of company do they work for you can tell just through even like the website their website uh or just the industry that they're in you can tell if they have a lot of money if it's a big name company like something like a Ghirardelli chocolate or Disney or some of these other companies that we work for, you know, they have big budgets. And so if they're trying to lowball you, you know that there's something wrong there because you can charge them a good amount. But if there's a, they're a new startup or a small mom and pop business in your local town, you know, you aren't going to be able to charge as much. And so find out as much information as possible. And then one of my best tips for, freelancers is to stick to your rate when I was starting out okay there's two sides to this when I was starting out it was hard to find work and you had to take the low paying jobs to get your name out there to start putting together a reel and portfolio of work and so I was shooting weddings for a couple hundred dollars and I did two of those and now I won't take a wedding if I'm not making at least three or four thousand dollars because they are a lot of work, especially editing. And so when you're starting out, you might have to do that. But after you have a portfolio, after you have done a few projects, stick to a rate. So for me with editing a few years ago, uh, my base editing rate was $35. And if they couldn't pay that $35 an hour, then I wouldn't take the project. And now it's a lot higher. It's it ranges, but lowest is maybe like $50 an hour. But a lot of my projects, I'm getting paid $90 to $100 an hour for editing and motion graphics work. Uh, and just sticking to that rate makes me feel a lot better about the work I'm doing. I don't get frustrated when a client asks me to do a number of edits because I know I'm getting paid a decent amount, um, a really great amount. But you also have to charge higher as a freelancer because you have to pay taxes on that money. And you're, you have to pay for healthcare. You have to pay for all these things that you might get at a normal nine to five job as a freelancer. And so charging a 40 or $50 hourly rate might seem like a lot of money to someone who's making $20 an hour at their full-time job, but they don't realize that you're paying 30% or so of that money in taxes and you have to pay for your own health insurance uh, without having a company help you out in that area and all sorts of other things. And so sticking to your rate is hard, but it's one of my best pieces of advice for, for freelancers to stick with it because if you're not getting paid what you want in the long run, you're going to get burnt out. So let me, take that all and type it up for Joseph, try to condense it into a few sentences or so. As for charging a customer, this is always one of the hardest things for new videographers, freelancers. The first thing that I do 
is calculate how much is how much is it worth it how much is my time worth how, is an hour worth fifty dollars is an hour worth fifteen dollars depending on where you live it might be calculate taxes taxes equipment costs it's another thing you have to pay for your own equipment and that has to be built into the money you make across the projects that you do the so things like health care that you need to pay for as a freelancer Ben, estimate how much time project will take. Actually, what I'm going to do is add a link to an article I wrote about charging hourly versus fixed prices, because this is a whole other issue. Do you charge an hourly rate or do you charge a fixed project rate? And so this article goes into all that, how much to charge for freelance work. This is a great article that I wrote that will help all of you out. So let me just, this is a good response to this, this question, to read this article that I wrote. But my best advice is to stick to a rate and not go lower because if you go lower especially if you're working on a project that you don't like and you're not excited about it's not going to be fun and you're going to hate it and that's just going to again get you burnt out on this whole video creating freelance thing that you're doing the only time you go lower only only times you go lower is if you are just starting out need projects to add to your reel. Now some of you might be, this is what you're doing. You are going to be freelance video, doing video creation, editing, whatever it is, or bust. But for me, I always wanted to have a reliable income. So I was finding full-time work related to video where I was making video, but it was important for me to have that stability. So I had that full-time job and then I was doing freelance work on the side. And so I built up that side freelance business <coughs> to the point where I could do it full-time. I could make the amount of money that I need to survive and thrive. Um, but that's hard when you're starting out. Only if they are projects you'll have fun on. Because you don't want to be on a project that you're not getting paid for and you hate. Okay. Joseph, that was a long answer. Hopefully you're watching this because I talked a lot more than what I wrote out. All right, Kurt asks, any tips or tricks you use when trying to convey your message in a 30-second commercial spot? I find when I lay it out, it makes sense, but when you get to filming time, timing never works out as the script was wrote. Any suggestions? That's a great question, something that I've been dealing with. Just this morning, actually, I was on a call with a client for a video that I was editing. We, uh, I edited a piece that was two minutes long, so a lot longer than 30 seconds. And the lady was like, uh, they don't, I don't, I need more information. I need more details. And I told her, okay, I can give you more details, but it's going to be a lot longer. And so sometimes when you have a specific time that you uh, are, you have a specific amount of time you're trying to edit a video down to, like 30 seconds or two minutes, you have to be very careful about what information you use. 
And so my best tip for getting that information is while you are doing the filming, now it's different if you're doing like a narrative commercial like scripted or doing interviews and you can write a script for both. I think it's important to write a script for both. Uh, but it, but um, when you are doing the interviewing and the filming, especially with interviews, ask them to repeat their answers. Uh, tell them to, to say it in a certain way. There's some people that say that's a little unfair or un, unjust, but as long as they believe what you are saying, then I think it's totally fair to say to the person you're interviewing, I hear what you're saying and can we condense it to sound like this because we have to get this down to 30 seconds. When you're filming someone, when you're interviewing someone for a commercial or for whatever project, they don't realize how long it takes for them to explain something, to talk about something. People will talk for minutes on end and won't ever get to a point. Um, and so as a director, it's very important to know how to get direct people, direct interview, interviewees to say things in a certain way that will work for the edit. As an editor, it's so, it's so great that I fell in love with editing because when I do do video production, video work on the production side, like shooting and um, directing, which I do a, a lot of, I can tell when an answer is good or not. And so this project that I was working on recently, I wasn't up there filming with them. But if I had been, I probably would have interjected during the filming and said, okay, this is great. Now, can you say it like this? And so I think that's really important to do as a director. Okay, so let me respond to Kurt. Great question, Kurt. I think it depends on if you are doing a narrative scripted commercial or a more documentary interview style commercial. If you are writing a script for a narrative, then you should know what 30 seconds looks like. It should, I mean, really on a page, it's like a few lines, maybe half a page, if that. And so um, if you're doing a narrative, it's easier to condense something down to 30 seconds because beforehand, you know, I mean, you're, re you're writing out your script, so you should read it out loud and see, okay, is this going to take 30 seconds or not? And you should cut it down to 30 seconds. But it's harder when you're doing the more interview style. You're cutting down a bunch of interviews down to 30 seconds. I'm saying it's a lot harder when you have a bunch of interviews, for example, and are trying to cut it down to 30 seconds. Best advice is to bring the interview ask people to say their answer in a specific way. The way you, you wrote it in a script because even if you are doing interviews it, if you're doing a commercial it's important to have a script and this is what i do when i'm shooting commercial projects or projects that um we're doing interviews with i write out a script so that when we film i have a sense of what am i trying to get from this person what answers am i trying to get from this person and when, um, again, when we're doing the interview, if they say something a certain way or not, that's what I'm looking for and I'll tell them to do it in a certain way. Okay, so let me just refresh. I'm gonna continue answering that question a bit, uh, but we're coming up on an hour. I can't believe this has gone so fast. And there's a couple more questions. I see there's a few viewers. Since this is coming up for an hour and I've finished found that it's a lot harder than I thought to type in answers and then talk to people on the camera. I'm actually going to close up the video. I'm going to stop live streaming and I'm going to answer all your questions on the Ask Me Anything. So if you have more questions, I'll be around for another half hour or so asking questions. So 
please go to the page down below. And then the other thing is to please enroll in some of those classes on Skillshare. If you are on Skillshare and on the page, you can see the classes of mine on the right side of that page or click my profile page uh, by clicking the little image of me on the right side. You can also go to my website, videoschoolonline.com, where I'm constantly blogging about all sorts of topics related to video creation, building a business, photography, design, all sorts of things. Uh, and there you can find my Facebook page, my YouTube page, which I would love for you to check out, subscribe, like, you know the drill. And so for the few viewers that are still with me, I hope I didn't bore you too much. Um, and I am glad you are here. And for anybody that is watching this replay in the future, uh, thank you for watching it. And uh, I will try to do another Ask Me Anything soon on different topics because this was fun. So anyways, thanks a lot, and we'll see you on the Skillshare page and back on videoschoolonline.com. Have a great day.